Yeah, and, and I'll jump in just to, to first say thanks for hosting and thank you to the Walton Family Foundation for, for having this conversation. I am on the opposite side of pollsters. I am a practitioner, so I run an organization called Millennial Action Project, and we are the largest cross-partisan organization of millennial and Gen Z lawmakers in the country, and our work is to help them build bridges so that political polarization is not an obstacle to solving our country's big problem. And so the things that came out in this survey about wanting unity, about wanting ways to come together and solve problems, this is the community of people who are going to institutionalize that within our democracy. Um, and, and I will say to, and, and maybe this is to answer your earlier question, I do think that the more that we can have women in these roles in leadership positions who know what it is to not have the, the, the same resources or to struggle with work-life balance um, and to make those decisions on behalf of their states, of their communities, I think the more that they can be in these positions of power to pass legislation, to pass rules that open up the door to more people serving and then to them uh, expanding those opportunities to, to women workers, I think that's so important. Um, I'll say one you know, member of our, our network um, just a few years ago was the first woman in her state to give birth while in office. And this is like a few years ago, like pretty recently. And that made her realize that when she went to go run for re-election, it was literally illegal for her to use her campaign funds to pay for childcare. And so she changed the law. And without having women at the table, women are on the menu. And that is just some of the ways in which we start to see the representation create more opportunities for um, women leadership and women to sort of build the world that this survey is, is demanding. I think one of the first things that you have to do is create that space where trust can happen. Change only moves at the speed of trust. And so to take away uh, the baggage that comes with political labels or any other kind of assumptions you might have about the other person requires you to find some superordinate identity that you can both connect to. Is it that you're part of the same neighborhood? Are you part of the same department at work? Are you, you know, what is, what is that element that you can connect on and start from there and then build forward? Um, you know, I, I, I would say what we've seen in, in our network is um, among all state legislators, Women under the age of 45 make up 6% of state legislators, and yet they are in 30% of legislative leadership positions. Women under the age of 45 hold 30% of the legislative leadership seats. And so to be successful in those roles, you have to be able to build consensus. You have to be able to listen to different perspectives, build your coalitions. And so I think flipping this idea of listening and empathy as a weakness and actually presenting it as a leadership strength gets people excited about flexing that muscle and doing more of it because they see how it helps them rise and helps them succeed. If, if, you, if you're trying to, to manipulate this idea of collaboration, not because you want to listen to what the other person has to say, but because you want to persuade them of your idea, then it's not it's just not gonna work. Maybe it'll work by accident, but most of the time people can sniff that out if you're not being authentic. And so being, you know, doing the hard work of, of laying the groundwork, building those relationships, um, actually having a, a conversation, then enables you to do it well once the time comes. If you sort of parachute in out of nowhere and you're like, hey, I'd love to hear your perspective on, you know, this, this idea, and then immediately like try to tell them why they're wrong, like that's gonna, that's gonna backfire. Yes, you're totally right. It is exhausting a lot of the time to be in charge and make all the decisions and feel like the buck stops with you every single time. Like it gets kind of old. And I think this shows up in the survey as well. Like the value of a peer network in navigating that is so incredibly important. And I think it helps re-spark the joy, the why. Why did you want this leadership position in the first place? And if you didn't want the leadership position and you just ended up there because you were the best person for the job, why did you want, why do you care about the mission of the job? Why do you care about the place where you're at? And having that peer network, I think, is incredibly re-energizing. Um, you know, I'll say in working with um, the Walton Family Foundation, we've been really grateful to have them help us convene, not just across political ideologies, but across sectors, right? And then that starts to re-spark 
curiosity, joy of leading and learning from people who are not just sort of on the other side of the aisle from you, but like in a different universe. And so I think the more that you can create a peer network, but then also open people up to that curiosity, that joy that leaders all have to embody, that's how you start to minimize the like, I'm so exhausted and reawaken the, I am so fired up. My parents were both born in Morocco and emigrated to New York. And so when I um, started working, they did not have a ton of contacts or mentors for me to tap into in, uh, in Washington, DC. And so it felt really scary and really lonely. And I didn't see a lot of people who looked like me or who were my age or were Moroccan. Um, and I, I totally agree a lot of the, the um, sort of contacts that, that I met, just being curious at different events or conferences, men, women, people older than me, younger than me, like just learning so much and feeling comfortable in my own skin, I think has been such a gift in making me confident in rooms that I walk into now to, ha to ask those questions, to start those conversations, to be okay walking into a cocktail hour where I don't know anybody and just introducing myself. Um, and I think one thing that that has taught me is the responsibility that I have to be proactive to those who come behind me. Um, recently in a conversation at work, I was giving, um, you know, just some coaching to, to one of our staff members. And I said the word like, you know, I love just mentoring you. And she was like, oh, I was hoping you would be my mentor. I didn't know if like I had to apply or like what the <laughs> process was. Um, and so to your point, like, the, the, the idea of where mentorship comes from and how we can be proactive about giving it and removing that maybe fear or barrier that younger generations feel about like how to even access people who can help them grow. Um, I see that regardless of how old you are, your responsibility to reach out a hand to those who come behind you. I totally agree with what Kristen and Shannon are saying and would add, after you ask employees what they think, then you have to tell them what you did about it. And some of the most impactful things are the least visible. And so being, you know, remembering that just because you did it doesn't mean that people know how hard it was or what it actually accomplishes or how that's part of a larger strategy of incremental change that will ladder up to something big. And so I think that feedback loop, people often see just like the tip of the iceberg or, or stop at that first half and that repeat back or, or sort of response is so important in actually getting people to feel like they're engaged and co-creating the process. And that's how you build meaningful employee engagement, a sense of belonging, a sense of we're making change together and I'm happy to be here. I think some of the things we've, we've talked about apply here too in um, how, you, how you do sort of professional development or leadership training to help coach people into how you, how you listen to others to understand, not listen to respond. And I think that our instinct as people is to sort of as you're, you know, how many people have like gone around and you know, had to say your name, introduce yourself, and you're not even thinking about what other people's names are. You're just like, my name is Layla, my name is Layla, I'm gonna say Layla when it gets to me. And so we're, we're sort of conditioned to like be really focused on what's inside of us and less about what's inside of other people. And that's a skill that, that can be practiced and learned and, and trained. Um, I think on the on the flip side, when you're intentionally trying to diversify your workforce or the you know a legislature, um, making sure that the new people who you're bringing in have the support that they need to be successful too, because they're going to meet um, an institution or a set of cultures and norms that are maybe not fully ready for them, and that change might take time. But to ensure that you're thinking about both sides of the equation and putting in the investments to navigate that transition in a way that is supportive of the individuals in, in either side. I mean, everything is really divided. <laughs> um, and, and we've been able to facilitate conversations on just about any issue under the sun. It just takes time. It takes building that trust. And um, one of the most important things that I think we can do, especially as we're building up millennial and Gen Z leaders, is to help them build the muscle memory early, right? Like you can think about our work as like building a gym for collaboration so that they get really strong and good at it. And as they rise the ranks of leadership and their committee chairs and their speaker of the house and their president, it's second nature, they're good at it. And they've got a network of peers who are also good with it because they met when they were young and they rose up together and now they all have the same ability to facilitate conversations. Um, and so, you know, you see um, 
the, the way that we bring people together is something called a future caucus. We're in 33 states right now, red states, blue states, purple states. Um, and so you can have these conversations if you focus on the whole person first and then introduce the issue after you've established that trust. So, so I would actually build off of what Shannon just said in thinking about complicating the narrative, right? And so the stories that, that you're telling should be authentic to the audience that you serve and, and, and meet their need, but you're a media company, right? And there's so many good stories to report on that are coming from Republicans, from Democrats, from independents. And I think the more that you can expose your audience to stories that force them to hold multiple truths at once, the more you can give them the gift of nuance that so many media companies are unable to do. Maybe they're, you know, uh, have just like one second of their attention and, and um, the more you can um, expose somebody to something that is different from what they know, the more you help them grow. And so, you know, I would just say that's probably the biggest gift you can give your audience is to find, source those stories and to, to showcase some of the ways that, that um, increase the horizon of your worldview. To that point, at the local level, I think what I'm seeing some of the best lawmakers do across the political spectrum is the ones who care about listening to different perspectives and building coalitions are right now going out and doing community engagement work. They're not waiting for the general election because they just think they have it in the bag and they're just gonna appeal to the base. The lawmakers who really care about building inclusive policy and listening to different ideas are doing their community building now. And so I would say um, when you go back home, look up who your state legislator is, sign up for their emails, get in, you know, get on just the distribution list so you can hear what they're doing and um, you'll, you'll see right away if there's somebody who is sort of holding these values of building unity, of working towards um, common solutions, or if they're like, you know, just planning on being part of the political sideshow in 2024.